Good evening, God bless you, and welcome to Calvary Grace. This is our last service in May, and it's a great joy to have you join us. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, bring your word to life. Let it touch into the lives of these people. Father God, I just pray that you'll just lift them and encourage them and strengthen them as we go through your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. And it says, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. By the way, right there, we have a problem. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. And he brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had, because a temple had not yet been built in the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking around, uh, pardon me, walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt offerings on the high places. Let me just stop for a moment. I remember recalling a, an archaeologist who had been digging through Israel. And he said that he and his team had come to the conclusion that there never was the worship of one God in Israel. Because every time they went to a mountaintop or a high place, they found shrines to various gods. And yet the Bible tells us these things existed and the people worshiped there. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt offerings, uh, burnt incense, on the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask whatever you want of me or want me to give you. And Solomon answered, you've shown me great kindness. And to my father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've committed this or continued this great kindness to me and have given me a son to sit on the, uh, given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. And the Lord was pleased. Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, not a long life or wealth for yourself, or have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do for you what you've asked, and I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be again. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And, I will, uh, and if you'll walk in my ways and obey my statutes and my commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon woke and realized it had been a dream. 
and he returned to Jerusalem and stood before the Lord's uh, covenant, uh, the Ark of the Lord's covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and then he gave a feast for all his court. Right after this story, two women bring one baby, and in the story is that both women each had a baby, and during the night one of the women rolled over and killed one of the babies accidentally. And so to find out who was the true mother, because both of them were claiming the baby, he said, bring me a sword, let's cut the child in half. And the one that, that, that complained the most and said, no, no, let the child be, he realized that was the true mother. That was just a test of his tremendous wisdom that God had given him. This morning I spoke on the heart of man is desperately wicked. And I tied it into what was going on in our times. Truly, we live in terrible times. You'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to not understand the times we live in. They are on a wicked level I, I don't think the world has seen since the time of Noah. And it's getting worse and will get worse until the Lord comes. And here in this great story, we see something about Solomon. He's smart enough, having seen how God dealt with his father, to realize he doesn't have the heart to govern this people. And he needs God to give him a wise and discerning heart. And he was so intent on this and God was delighted because God said, since you haven't asked for the death of your enemies and you haven't asked for money and you haven't asked for a long, healthy life and so on, I'm going to give you all that anyhow. But I am going to give you a discerning heart and you will be a king like no other. There will be nobody to equal you in your lifetime. And of men, there'll be none like you. Sometime later, the queen of Sheba comes. Her name isn't Sheba. She's the queen of a nation called Sheba. And she sees all Solomon has achieved. And she said, the half hasn't been told me. His wealth and his opulence was spectacular by any human standard. I don't think we have enough gold in our world to do what he did. Oh yes, I understand we have the same amount of gold he had, but he had it in hand. And you see, he would build a temple and he would literally lay one brick on the other with molten gold in between. And then he would line the interior walls of the temple with solid gold. Such was his blessing from God. And such was his wisdom to design this building, this structure, and to have it created according to his plan. You see, when God said, I'm going to give you a discerning and a wise heart, there was a tremendous change in this man. And I've come to the conclusion that that's what we need as believers, discerning and wise hearts. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, we read this. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. You know, when we come to this word heart, both in Greek and in Hebrew, we tend to think of it as our beating heart. And certainly we only have one heart, and without it, we're dead. No doubt. But it has a lot more meaning in Semitic literature particularly in Jewish literature. 
And since the New Testament was written in Greek, but by Jews, for Jews, and about Jews, we need to understand what they're talking about here. The heart is the central core of a man from which he makes decisions. It's not the thing so much that you fall in love from. Love in those days was born out of duty and honor and respect. And families would marry their children sometimes while they were children and they would grow up and then they would actually hold a marriage ceremony, but they would be engaged as children. And so love didn't really enter into it. Commitment entered into it. Honor entered into it. And there were other aspects of the love and family commitment. But when the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about that center from which you make decisions. I spoke this morning about the slaughter of the 19 children in Uvalde, Texas. What a disgusting, horrible, terrible thing. But the problem is not as most people see it. Most people see this as a gun problem. And if we just had less guns, well, that didn't stop Timothy McVeigh, who blew up a building. Uh, it hasn't stopped, oh, so many over the years that have used knives, vehicles, bombs, poison. I, I could go on the multitude of ways that there are to kill and kill a lot of people, not just a few. Are guns readily available? Yes. Is that a problem? Probably. But the real issue, the real problem is not a gun. Any more than you can turn to a car and say, well, the real problem with car accidents is we need to get rid of cars. You'll discover that won't solve it. And as a matter of fact, the powers that be know that. That's why they're looking now at having cars drive themselves. And within just a couple of years, all new vehicles will be able to drive themselves entirely, take you out of the equation entirely, because they've come to the conclusion, you're the problem. And they're right. The issue is the heart of man. The heart of man. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, says, Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. I, I've so often, I've, I've seen this as a pastor. I've seen people come in and uh, come to the church, particularly young people. And I've seen them disconnect, dragged to church against their will and disconnect from what's going on. And they become hard and tough. And they go out and they do things they shouldn't do. In Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, we read this. God speaking now of Israel. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them the heart of stone and give them the heart of flesh. Boy, I tell you, that's what this generation needs. We have been toughened. And as a matter of fact, people enjoy being toughened. I, I think of so many people that not only read but go to movies that are based solely on horror. Not mystery, horror, murder, killing.
And when you ask them why, they say, I just get a charge out of it. What's actually happening? They're becoming hardened and toughened. And God said, I'll put a new spirit in them and I'll take that stony heart and I'll put in a heart of flesh. I will reconnect their conscience. I will give them a heart for me. Then they'll follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts are devoted to vile images and detestable idols, I will bring down on their own heads what they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. There are some that are devoted to wicked things. And God said, fine. I'll let you suffer the consequences from that. You know, God said this kind of thing several times. In, in another passage, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. He is describing what he is going to do for Israel. And I believe it's going to happen during the millennial period. But I want you to know as believers, I believe that he's done the same thing in us. He's created in us a new heart, a soft heart, a tender heart, a heart for love and a heart for mercy and a heart for grace. Not a tough, stony heart that makes us hard, stiff-necked. He'll say it again, but this time not in Ezekiel. Now we'll pick up that same story in Jeremiah. See, God doesn't say it just once, but out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Come over to Jeremiah 31, verse 31 for a moment. Jeremiah 31, 31. A time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. And it won't be like the covenant I made with the forefathers when I took them by the hand and I led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, just like a husband shelters and protects his wife, I was like that with Israel. I led them out. I protected them. I looked after them, but they turned their back on me. So the next covenant I make with them is not going to be the same because I know what they're going to do. Verse 33, this is the covenant I'll make with Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write on their heart and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Isn't it interesting? He didn't say, listen, I'm going to tattoo it on their flesh. Wouldn't it have been something if God had come along and said, listen, the moment you get saved, you're going to get the Ten Commandments tattooed on your chest. And some people do that stupidly. But he said, I'm going to write it not on your flesh, but I'm going to write it on your heart. So many times I've had people come to me and ask me, is it right? And they spell out some scenario. Is it right for me to do this or do that? And I know full well, they know exactly what's right and what's wrong. But what they're looking for is a way out. And what they would like is for me to say, Oh, yes, and here's how we can justify it. The reason they know right from wrong is because if they're saved, God has put his law on our hearts. And we are not bound to the letter of the law and the verse. But we are still believers in Jesus Christ and must walk as he did. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, we read this. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, 
that we might receive the full rights as sons. Because you are sons, God sent his spirit into our hearts, and the spirit calls out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father is simply Father, Father in two separate languages, Greek and Hebrew, or Hebrew and Greek. And so what he's saying here is, listen, when you got saved, God sent his spirit into you and brought you into the family. And now you don't call out God necessarily, but Father. Father, Heavenly Father. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, Our Father. How could you consider him your Father? Well, he's put his spirit in you, and it's given you a new heart, a new direction. There's been a change in you. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you're a son, God has also made you an heir. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. There's a change in us. I I don't believe that real, genuine Christians are killers. Could they kill? Yes. Have they killed? Absolutely. Mental illness can affect anybody. And anybody can do something in the spirit of the moment. But I don't believe that's our nature. That's not who we are as people. We are peace-loving, we are merciful, we are gracious, and we show to the world what God has done for us. In Ephesians chapter 4, 17, or verse 17, we read this, Ephesians 4, 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking, They're darkened in their understanding and separate from a life in God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Have you ever been witnessing to somebody and just watch them them gloss over? I've had that happen many times. You can talk about anything you want in many cases and people will, eh, they'll receive it. But the moment you bring that conversation around to Jesus and what he did on the cross and salvation, you can just watch the faces gloss over because of the hardening of their hearts, the Bible says. By the way, if that happens to you, what you need to do is start to pray right there and then silently to yourself, God, in the name of Jesus, open up this person. Remove the blinders from their eyes. Let them see who you really are. Verse 19, having lost all sensitivity. See, our, our, our society is doing everything to desensitize people. And again, I come back to horror, the entire genre of horror. Whether you're reading it, whether you're watching it, or whether you're living it, It is designed to desensitize you. If you want to see that in action, look at what sergeants do with their troops. They get them in and they begin to to humiliate them. They yell right in their faces, screaming at them. And the idea is that these men are meant to toughen up and become desensitized to this kind of thing. Because they've got to take good people and turn them into killers. And it's a process of desensitizing. You would not believe how desensitized you have become. If you want to know how desensitized you've become, go back and watch some TV on YouTube from the 1950s. And see if you find it interesting. Watch the Donna Reed show. Father Knows Best. Leave it to Beaver. The Lucy Show. I could go on 
and name 50 of them. See how much of that you can watch. My three sons. Before you just absolutely fall asleep. Because there's no sex. There's no violence. There's no hatred. There's nothing that we're used to in what we call situational comedies today. In those days, it was about being embarrassed. We'll have to change this because if we don't, it will be embarrassing. And that was the worst that could happen. Now it's all about sex. In so many areas. We are being slowly boiled alive by the media and desensitized to violence. And that's why people have no problem going out and committing violent acts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality. That, again, describes our media today so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ in that way. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. And here's what it says, Hebrews 3, 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of the testing in the desert. Where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years, I saw what they did. That's why I was angry with that generation and said their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared on an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart and turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If we come to share in Christ, or we have come to share in Christ, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did during the rebellion. There may be some listening to me right now who have withstood the call of God, who have hardened themselves and said no. And though God kept knocking on the door, though God keeps calling, by the way, he will stop one day. He said in Genesis, my spirit will not always contend with man. But if you've heard his voice, and you've never come to Christ, I beg you, come to Christ. Let him change your heart. Let him take that killer nature and replace it with one that is merciful, kind, loving, and so on. Let him make changes in you. Don't harden your heart as they did back in the rebellion. And by the way, because they hardened their hearts, they spent 40 years walking around the desert, wasting time. Do you know that Israel was never more than three days march from the land at any time? But for 40 years, they walked in circles because of their hard hearts. For 40 years, I wonder how many people that might be listening to me have spent their lives walking in circles because they hardened their hearts. 
This is your opportunity. This is your moment. I'm going to pray. And if you'll pray with me, God will save you and change your heart. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, that man, that woman, that boy, that girl that's listening to me right now, if they're crying out to you and saying, God, give me a new heart, I ask that you will soften their hearts, that you will change them, that you'll put your spirit inside them, that you give them new life, new direction, and a soft and tender heart, a heart of mercy, a heart of love, and a heart of grace. Lord, only you can do this thing. Only you can change the hearts of people. Our world needs more of you and less of our politicians and their wisdom. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.